Today on BRS TV Tank Trials, it's our first update on the ULM tanks. Are things going to plan? What have we done? And who wants a free Ecotec MP10 at the end? I'm Ryan, your host of BRS TV Tank Trials, ULM edition. This is episode 15 of ULM and development of an ultra low maintenance system. The goal is a stable, show caliber reef tank, which requires as little maintenance as possible, potentially only performing a few minutes of maintenance a month. I know we were supposed to put corals in the tanks this week, but we just had a couple feet of snow dump here in Minnesota, which closed our airport. Even though I was busy shoveling and wasn't thinking about it, the Worldwide Corals team was on top of it and rescheduled our shipment to accommodate for the weather. So this week we're going to give you an update on all three tanks, some things that worked, some surprises, probably even more importantly, some things that didn't go as planned. Learning from each other's mistakes sure beats having to experience them on our own. So I'm going to start with some of the notes that apply to all the tanks and then touch on each one individually. In that spirit, I'll start with the elements that apply to all three tanks. First, the longer cycle before adding corals has worked out really well. I just think it's a better way to start a tank. These tanks have had water in them for a couple months now, no light for a month, lowest light setting possible for at least another month. And I'm really confident that they're ready for corals. In fact, early on we seeded some coralline algae and you can see it to start to take hold. I know all of us want Insta tanks, fill them with water and go, which is indeed possible, but in reality everyone should just slow way down and set themselves up for success by giving the tanks a chance to stabilize before adding a ton of corals and light to the tank. Doing that will drastically reduce the chances of encountering many of the issues that new tanks encounter. I'm fairly confident that we're now set up for success. In relation to that, I really like the idea of starting the refugium with the tank launch and letting the Kato get stabilized before turning the light on in the tank. Ultimately, I think that worked out, and I would do it this way in the future, but it was not challenge free. The main issue is that Kato simply wanted to die more than it wanted to grow. I think there are three issues related to that. First, there were limited to no nutrients in the tank to begin with. Second, the light was too bright. And third, the photo period was probably too long. This is how I'd try this in the future to solve all three problems. I wouldn't add Kato until I added the first fish, so there was a direct source of ammonia that wasn't relying on decaying food, which can be somewhat slower. Second, I would start the light at just one hour a day, and then add an hour every week until I hit eight hours of on time. This could both help it acclimate to the very high intensity light, as well as a longer photo period. Once we turn back the photo period here to three hours, we didn't have an issue. To be honest, it would be nice if these H380s had intensity adjustments because it is rather bright under a cabinet where it's pretty close to the Kato. For that reason, many reefers might be better off using something like the Radeon XR15 Freshwater, which is adjustable. The spectrum on the XR15 isn't perfect for the application, but it will meet everyone's needs, lower profile and can be mounted higher, and the intensity is adjustable, so it may be a better option for some. Personally, I'm willing to manually acclimate the reduced photo periods for the horticulture or plant focused spectrum associated with the Kessel H380. Next, I'm really happy with having the automatically refilled freshwater reservoir at the tank. Guess I never really saw a lot of value in doing it this way before. In the past, I directly connected my RODI systems directly to the tank with layers of redundancy, which completely eliminates any work with topping off the tank and doing it safely. However, in this case, we're filling a freshwater reservoir at the tank first and then using an ATO to draw from that container. Now I have a container of freshwater at the tank, which allows me to use it for multiple purposes. I'll talk about it more in a minute, but one of those purposes, which has worked out really well, is feeding the calc reactors so I don't have to fill reservoirs for those either. Second, combined with the Tunes RO water controller, which allows the water to drop to a low level before it refills the entire container, I can avoid a lot of the issues with TDS creep and the higher TDS coming out of the RO membrane at startup. Net effect is my DI resin lasts a lot longer, meaning the solution will likely pay for itself at some point. It might be a while, but it's nice all the same. I will say the water controller has timed out a couple of times and not filled. Might be user error, but our solution was simply to use the Apex to restart the controller at noon each day. There are some risks associated with that, but with all our redundant safety measures and alarms, I'm not concerned. I'll also say putting the MP10s on the bottom of the tank is also something that I would absolutely do again. Not only are they almost completely hidden, but it keeps the bottom of the tank clean. Some bits of sand from the rock pile up in the lowest flow areas, but there's zero detritus or uneaten food piling up. Just clean and works well for a low maintenance tank like this one. Admittedly, it does need to be on a bare bottom tank and limited corals on the bottom of the tank, which is a trade-off I'm willing to make. 
The auto feeders with the Neptune crossover diet seem to work really well at making sure that all the fish are fed in a timely manner, including on the weekends when I'm not here. That's combined with the personal feeding of the Algae Extreme pellets, which allows me to interact with the tank and fish, as well as add multiple dietary needs. I may even incorporate some frozen items that I've used over time. Overall, the auto feeder seems to be a good ULM solution. I will note that I set them to feed a small amount of food so we don't build up unwanted nutrients or other food-based contaminants. I'll also say that I'm a huge fan of the redundant dual return pump installation and I've already had two instances where it worked out as intended. In both cases, something clogged when the CHA and Neptune pumps intake, but the flow through the sumps and filtration and life support was never interrupted because the other pump continued to run. I wish I could say one of these pump combo options was dramatically better than another, but all three options have worked out well. The lower cost AC CHAs, high power Neptune cores, and the tiny form factor Octopus Varios 2 pumps all run silent and do their job extremely well. Of course it's cool that the Neptune cores work well with their Apex controller, but admittedly they're a bit overpowered for a small tank like this, so we are running them at near 20 to 30%. All that said, I really wish I'd hard plumbed a manifold for one of the return pumps so I could use one to also feed equipment like our external skimmer and filtration like reactors. That was just a miss on my end. Now I'm going to have to manifold off the soft tubing and barb fittings, but it just isn't as clean. This may not seem like a big deal to many, but I personally also like the Tunes Care Magnet Cleaners that we've been using. They worked out really well. Randy and I debate this constantly because he actually likes the flippers best, but I like how the corners are rounded on the Tuneses, so as long as I use it oriented correctly, I don't have to be concerned about damaging the tank silicone. For me, this makes it easier to use and potentially a component of lower maintenance. Okay, moving on to some things that went right and wrong with each individual tank, starting with the softy tank. First, both of the heaters had to go. We just couldn't get them to operate properly, and they were six degrees under our NIST validated thermometers. Getting them to match up with the apex and work properly was a nightmare. I have to say, if you trust your heaters doing anything properly out of the box, you may want to reconsider. These are the most notoriously unreliable pieces of equipment on the entire tank. That means accuracy, operating range, as well as simply the most likely to fail. The only one that's personally worked for me in all three fronts and never failed me is the Cobalt Aquatics Neotherm, but I fully recognize that they have failed others, and even though our BRSTV Investigates testing found them accurate to a half a degree, stability of just five hundredths of a degree, the price point of hundred and thirty bucks for a three hundred watt heater is a bit hard to take. So rather than just switch to Neotherms and add two hundred and sixty dollars worth of heaters to a simple softy and polyps tank, we decided to try something new, and hopefully we'll all get to see how it works out. So we took out the Phoenix HMO heaters and swapped in the newer Phoenix HPGs, which are actually a bit cheaper at thirty-two bucks for a three hundred watt heater. I haven't used them before, but they're low profile, glass, but have a protective case. And what I like most is the thermostat is external rather than built into the heater itself, which certainly has a potential to provide more accurate on-off cycles. Anyways, after installing the new HPGs in the softy tank, our temp issues poofed and I'm much happier. I certainly won't promise the same results for everyone because I think reefers need to have realistic expectations for a $30 heater. It's never going to be bulletproof, but I hope it ends up being a viable low-cost option. For those of you who do want to have a more accurate window into the actual temp of your tank, I have a new favorite calibration thermometer with the HANA HI98509. It seems to be more accurate, read quicker than some of the other options, and at 39 bucks, it's more affordable as well. I just think it's wise to have something like this around to ensure your heaters are working as intended, as well as calibrate controllers properly. I'll also note that when we decided to go over to the automatic water change system as a method of maintaining major, minor, and trace elements for the softy tank, there wasn't a real reason to keep the fuge, so it's gone. One of the things I noticed was an increase in brown bacterial film, both on the rocks and glass, after we removed a major component of filtration. So for that reason, we're going to add a piece of filtration back to the mix with a somatic protein skimmer, which is an ultra-affordable CHA pump driven skimmer and should work well for a tank like this one. I'll also note on this tank, the number one extra coarse aqua mesh created that solid insta baffle as we intended and kept the Kato in place without ever getting clogged. Overall, for a quick and easy solution, this worked well. However, I would note that this design seems to trap a lot of detritus in the sump, and anytime we disturbed it, it clouds the tank fairly rapidly. 
I think adding the skimmer may help with that, but if it doesn't, I think I'm gonna have to find a way to incorporate a filter sock into the mix. Not for nutrient removal, because we have that covered, but just for detritus removal. So probably like a large eight inch sock or multiple four inch socks that can be swapped monthly. Moving on to the SPS tank, there are a few points to note. First, anecdotally, this tank needs to be cleaned about one-fourth as often as the other tanks. Glass almost never. And rather than all the rock being brown and covered in bacterial film, the rock is still white and doesn't need to be cleaned at all. The water is also visually clear. I can't say this 100% confidence, but if I had to guess, I would say it's likely because we're running the properly sized UV sterilizer on the system, which could very well drastically be reducing the amount of maintenance on the system. I have to say side by side the results are impressive enough that I'd like to start a BRS TV Investigate series on this to attempt to identify if this is really the direct cause. If it is, I think a cleaner, lower maintenance tank is enough reason to consider this type of filtration even without the parasite and disease management considerations. Related to that, I think part of the success could also be the Neptune flow meter, which tells me the actual flow going through the UV sterilizer so I can tune it to ensure proper contact time. Without that, you're either guessing or measuring flow with more manual methods. I'd wager almost everyone is not running the optimal flow rates through their UV sterilizer. With a flow meter, it makes it super easy to dial in. I'll also say the Avast Kelkwasser reactor coupled with that automatically filled freshwater reservoir at the tanks has turned out to be a real gem. The ability to dose controlled amounts of likely near fully saturated consistent potency Kelkwasser solution with an apparatus like a dosing pump is showing a lot of promise for being one of the simplest, lowest maintenance options that I've ever used. I say that because there's only one solution to dose, it's inherently balanced and there's no salinity issues to deal with. The only real work is refilling the Kelk reactor occasionally and adjusting the dose up over time as the corals grow. Right now I'm only dosing 200 milliliters a day of Kelk solution and the proof will be when we add corals, but I think there's a lot of reason to believe that this may be the best ULM option out there to consistently maintain calcium, alkalinity, and pH for a pretty decent portion of average tanks out there. On this tank, I have to say the aqua mesh in the small compartment feeding the return pumps didn't work out. The small amount of surface area just got clogged too fast. In this case, I added a larger sheet inside the compartment and that's worked out really well. That said, I have to say, I know we are limited on options with these small tanks, but I wish I had just bought something with a fuge incorporated or made my own design. Trying to convert sumps for purposes they were not intended for is a hassle and almost always has some issues as well as wasted space. Moving on to the LPS tank, in this case we had a neotherm as a primary heater and a low cost heater as a backup. After our experience with the softy tank, we thought it was prudent to test the performance of the backup if the primary failed, and we ran into the same accuracy issues, so despite my strong desire to just throw in another neotherm, I'm sticking to our original plan for this tank, which was a strong, robust primary heater and a low-cost backup, so we swapped that out in favor of a low-cost Phoenix HPG, which did indeed work better and will serve as a better solution as a backup. I'm not going to give uh, my full endorsement of this option because it is rather cheap and again we should have realistic expectations but I will share the results over time. Those of you that have been watching this whole series already know we couldn't fit a skimmer and fuge in the somatic sump so we're running a fuge only. So in the end we're running one tank with a skimmer as the primary filtration component, one with the fuge as the primary filtration component, and one with both. Much of this is just a personal preference and an option of running good versus good versus best. I will say I think running without either can certainly be done, but probably not the best idea on a variety of fronts. Sadly, we also lost a tail spot Blenny on the LPS tank, so we have to replace him. I wish I knew why or had some insight, but he just disappeared one day. Sad, but it does happen. I do have two other global notes on all the tanks. First, I did seed some Coraline to these tanks just by scraping some out of the 160, and you can see it's already starting to grow, which is nice. That said, along with it came some Spirorbid worms, which are tiny white spots that are growing the back of the tank. Not really a pest per se, but it does show you how easy it is to introduce unintended organisms into the tank. Lastly, we threw together some of Red Sea's new screen net top solutions and I have to say it came together nicely and it looks a lot cleaner than your typical DIY window frame solutions. The clips are awesome for rimless tanks like these and I'm very happy with how it looks. 
So everything is coming along pretty nicely, and I think that we're all ready for those corals from Worldwide next week. Pretty exciting times. Don't forget that we're giving away that Vortec MP10 this week, so hit that link in the lower left to sign up, or click on specials and deals in the site, then free stuff to sign up. And if you like what we're doing here, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell to be instantly notified when we're releasing new reefing videos all week long. See you next week with another episode of BRS TV Tank Trials.